Good morning, folks. It's Dave Burroughs at Barometer Capital Management. Uh, thanks very much for joining us today. I thought this might be a great opportunity uh, for us to have a little update on uh, what's going on market-wise, how we see things going, how we're positioned in the portfolios. You know, certainly it has been a long 150 trading days since January the 29th, uh, when over nine days we had a pretty significant 10.1% pullback. Uh, so I thought maybe we could review kind of what our view has been through the course of the year um, and, and sort of how our positioning has, has been, uh, been taken. Um, for those that uh, know us, they know that uh, we have a view that over a very long period of time, you see structural shifts, uh, asset class by asset class, uh, giving a real benefit to certain asset classes at certain points in time. And this is equities back to the 1890s. And we know that in dark blue, there have been several secular or structural multi-year bull markets driven by underlying change in the economy. And in each of those periods, you got long periods of multiple expansion and earnings growth, which led to significant gains, like in the 80s and 90s, 18% a year in the S&P 500. You know, this is common to virtually all asset classes. You had long waves in commodity prices. You've had very long-term moves in the interest rates. Uh, this is obviously an important conversation to be having right now. And our view has always been that, that our job is to understand the structural backdrop. You guys don't need us to find uh, something to own in every sector and every asset class. You're hoping that we're going to target asset classes that are relevant, sectors and themes that are benefiting from structural shifts. Um, we've always used a process that uses two, two basic pieces to build the portfolio. One is a security selection model aimed at finding securities that are going through some kind of positive change that are good getting better, where we can see in the numbers, fundamentals are getting better and ideally accelerating. And then from that list, build portfolios that are focused in pockets of the market that are seeing net new inflows of capital. What is it that the market has appetite for now? And we call that market leadership. And very simply, what we're always looking for is uh, over the course of a cycle, when a group of securities becomes underowned after a long decline, you know, generally the weakest securities get hurt first, and, and then more and more securities get hurt until eventually late in the decline, almost everything's being hurt. If something isn't being hurt late in the decline, it's, it's not a fluke. It's that they're doing something right. And when aggressive folks put money to work late in a down cycle and sentiment's negative, they'll generally start buying the strongest securities first, and then in a healthy market, over time, more and more securities participate in a rally. So one thing that is true is there's no major bear market or correction in history that ever took place while breadth or the percentage of securities performing well was expanding. That's money getting put to work. And similarly, every major decline or bear market in history has been preceded by weeks or months of deterioration in breadth. In other words, the weakest securities selling off first and then seeing it spread to more and more. Now, the reason this is relevant is we all spend our time looking at market cap weighted indices, indexes that are weighted to the very biggest securities. And generally, those aren't the first that break down. So we always want to know what's happening under the surface. Is money getting put to work? Is money leaving? And uh, so the models we run track breadth. And so uh, to take that forward, when breadth starts to deteriorate, our job is to get defensive. So the difficult thing is we are charged with determining whether we're looking at a correction or whether we're looking at a bear market. And there's a big difference. You can get short, sharp corrections in an up market that just shake people out, turn around, and take off. Our job is to determine whether a pullback is something that is lasting or whether it's something that is temporary. Uh, because certainly when things get difficult, breath starts to deteriorate, we raise some cash, we use different forms of hedging in the portfolios, we tighten up the stop losses we use in our positions, and of course, you know, we'll often sit on cash for an extended period of time if our work points to something that is significant. Now, quickly, um, we believe we started a new structural bull market for stocks in 2013. Why do we say, not say 2009, when the market bottomed after the crisis? 
Well, it's the same reason you would say um, you would say uh, it wasn't a market beginning of a bull market in 1974 after the 73-74 bear market, or at the end of the of the 1929-32 uh, collapse. There's recovery that takes place, and you don't eventually see a structural bull market until you start to see earnings multiples expand, and earnings multiples started to expand in 2013. So after 13 and 14, there was a good-sized correction in the U.S. market through 2015 summer into the early 2016 winter. And what looks like a blip on the U.S. equity chart, you know, was actually quite a much bigger deal uh, around the world. So really the problem was China and the problems washed from the slowdown in China into the countries that support uh, goods into China like the resource producers and the heavy equipment exporters like Germany and Japan. And eventually it worked its way through the Canadian market, the Canadian income index down 29% in that period, and then eventually it hit the S&P the last thing that got sold, the thing that had nothing to do with the problem. So this is where breadth models are very useful. Of course, in, in the early part of February 2016, so two and a half years ago, we saw breadth bottom out at 20%, meaning only 20% of stocks in the U.S. market were holding up in price, and then breadth started to expand. So that was the best entry point we had seen since October of 2011 or March of 2009 prior to that. And this was a time when there was a lot of negative sentiment. Now our view was that like after the first bull market correction in each of the last two long-term bull markets, the 80s and 90s and 50s and 60s, after that correction, you were gonna get a very significant three-year rally. So what happened? We had two excellent years leading up to January 30th of this year with one, two, three percent corrections. And people talked about how unusual that is, but in fact, it's very, very similar to what's happened in previous secular bull markets. So let's push that around a little bit. Of course, 10.1 percent correction from the end of January through February the 9th. So if you go back to the early 1950s, after the first two and a half years, it was a 15 percent correction and then you basically got a three-year straight-up move. Well, in fact, two years straight up, a short-term correction, and then one more very good year. So this is what it looked like. You had an 88% move over two years, and when the first correction came, it was 8.8% over three weeks, like a punch in the face that came out of nowhere. And of course, people weren't used to the volatility because they'd had two years of no volatility. But then what happened? Right. The market rallied 20% in the next six months in the third leg. And then, of course, you got a real correction that went on about 18 months. And when that correction came, breadth, and I have the data, deteriorated for three months prior to that correction. Lots of heads up to get defensive. If you go to, if you go to the early part of the – it's just one moment. If you go to the early part – of the uh, 1980s, after the first major correction, you basically got a three-year straight-up move. Well, actually, the first part with no volatility, and when the first correction came, it was 8.4% over six days. And then the market rallied another 54% in the third leg of that bull market. That was 86 through the summer of 87. And in fact, um, you had uh, you had um, uh, a good sized correction, as we know, in the fall of 1987. But you had four months of deteriorating breadth leading up to that point, an opportunity to get defensive. Both of those third year rallies were things that took people from disbelieving the bull market to everybody believing it. Now we've been through a very difficult 150 days, uh, and coming out of that, you know. Um, here we are, 8.8% intraday or 10.1% to the bottom, February the 9th, just like the other two, very short-lived. Both of them had to spend some time consolidating. We had a number of retests of the moving averages, and here we are, we've now made a new all-time high. So very difficult because it's against the backdrop of a lot of bad news, a lot of scary things on the Twitter tape. 
But what we would say is we've just lived through a typical bull market correction. And what we have in front of us is likely six to eight months of exceedingly strong markets as people throw in the towel and realize, actually, fundamentally, things are getting a lot better. So what do we see? We saw that breadth deteriorated through February, bottomed in April, and has been improving ever since for the NYSE market, U.S. equities. You had sentiment go from extreme greed in the end of January to extreme fear going through that correction. When we look at all the major indices, S&P 500 new all-time high, NASDAQ new all-time high, Russell 2000 all-time high, Value Line Index. The Value Line Index is an index of 1,700 companies equally weighted. It takes out the impact of one or two big companies impacting the index. That broad index has gone to a new all-time high. So U.S. equities solidly in, on, a, on a positive footing. So it's not for no reason. Right. If we look at the earnings over the last number of quarters, this is the percentage of companies beating the estimates. And of course, this past quarter, almost 80% of companies beat the analyst estimates. What does that mean? It means the analysts have been too cautious. They don't understand how strong the change is in the underlying economy. Now, a lot of people would say, well, that's financial engineering. It's been cost cutting and share buybacks. Well, really, no, it's, it's sales growth. This was the best quarter of sales growth we've seen in years just about 12% sales, you can't fake sales growth. So sales and earnings have been progressively getting stronger and stronger. Not only that, the estimates for upcoming earnings are being ratcheted higher by analysts as they realize they're behind the curve. So when people say the market's expensive based on earnings, well, the earnings estimates have been too low. And so for this upcoming year and the rest of this year, estimates are going higher that's really unusual because it tends to be analysts start out very aggressive at the beginning of the year, and as the year goes on, they have to take their estimates down. And then when we look at profit margins, profit margins continue to expand. So improving sales, improving earnings, improving margins, those are pretty good things. And it's not getting worse. When we look at leading indicators in the U.S., virtually every state is growing, some faster than others. Nothing is decelerating. So we try to find things that are good getting better. U.S. equities are good getting better. We're just starting a third leg. And while there will be little pullbacks, we think it's more significant than people understand. Now, lots of folks are concerned about tariffs, and I understand that. The previous example that people talk about is the trade wars that happened in the 1930s. But you have to remember, this was happening against a very difficult backdrop. The U.S. economy was in depression not just recession. And so when you have bad news on top of bad news, that has a big impact. The U.S. is in a very strong position to be negotiating currently because the backdrop is so positive. When the market isn't behaving the way that you would expect it to, given the news, generally there's some things you're not considering. And I think people are overlooking the very, very strong fundamentals. It can go on for a long time. In, the, in, the, in, in reality, the impact of all of these tariffs is dwarfed by some of the fiscal stimulus that's going on in the economy. So <clears throat> baseline belief is we are in the third year of the first part of a structural bull market. Two opportunities. One is to take advantage of market as it is today. Second, we'll be somewhere out there, six, eight, 12 months from now, there is going to be a real correction. And we'll watch very closely for bread deterioration. It just doesn't exist today. Correlations sector to sector and stock to stock are falling, meaning the market's behaving like a market. There's have and have nots. This is interesting. The Russell 2000 Technology Index has just made the first new all-time high since 2000. So if you tend to start a new bull market, when you exceed the high from the previous bull market, small mid-cap bull market may just really be beginning. So this can go on for a long time. So from a sector perspective, uh, it's been pretty clear through the year. These sectors are fairly economically and domestically focused. Technology has been the strongest sector by a mile, and that's a ubiquitous term that includes software. Uh, and we can see both breadth for software sector is improving and the percentage of stocks of positive momentum is improving. 
near-term and intermediate-term, very positive. Semiconductors, the same picture. Cloud-based companies, companies that are focused in cloud computing, leading the market. Cybersecurity. So technology is very strong. Let's move to industrials. Well, we've been focused in aerospace and defense for about three years. It continues to make new highs. But also in industrials, mid-small cap machinery manufacturers, companies that benefit from corporate spending and, and, and executive optimism. Transportation stocks, you can't fake moving goods from one place to another. If there is not uh, commerce taking place, these are not leading the market. So truck tonnage, very, very strong in the U.S. In healthcare, domestically focused, medical devices, a lot of this is medical technology, very positive. Me uh, healthcare service providers, very positive. Pharmaceuticals, very positive, and biotech, very positive. Let's talk about consumer discretionary, very, very strong. Consumer services uh, and, uh, of course, internet retail, and actually retail as a whole, making new all-time highs. In financials, fintech, technologies related to financial services, uh, mobile payments, very strong. And the banks uh, consolidated through the early part of 2017, and then from September on, made all of their returns, had a very significant rally into February. We've just done the same kind of consolidation through the course of this year, and looks like uh, the big banks are about to break out, as are the investment banks that benefit from stronger, stronger markets. So technology, consumer, healthcare, financials, we are focused in U.S. equities, by far our biggest weight across the firm. Globally, breadth is expanding for equities, so equities globally in pretty good shape, but you really have to pick your spots. Europe really is not participating in this. We're not focused there. European stocks not only are falling in price from an index perspective, but the currency is hurting them. Asia. Asia started to see some small improvement, but in very select markets, specifically India, is most attractive. Japan is a quick second. Beyond that, emerging markets really are not the place, so we have a small amount of developed market outside of the U.S. China and other emerging markets clearly are a have-not. That's the emerging market ETF, steady lower lows and lower highs. We'll see if that can turn, but at this point, pretty clear picture. Emerging market debt, place that people have gone to get excess yield, that's not the place to focus on. So emerging market for us is very close to a zero. The only exposure we have that you could call emerging market would be Mexico, about a 5% weight. Uh, commodities, really not a place to be, avoiding commodities. Energy producers, there's a few that are behaving well. We do have some small exposure there. That's the best part of the commodities market. So again, commodities, very small weighting in the barometer portfolios. I think the biggest issue is fixed income. And we talk about big themes and big risks or opportunities. Fixed income offers a much bigger risk than I think people appreciate. This is long interest rates back to the 1700s. The last long down cycle in rates went from around the turn of the century to 1947, just as they have from 1981 through 2016. We think that the bond market peaked in the summer of 2016 for a generation, and that we are likely to see a series of lower lows and lower highs or rising interest rates. So, of course, the bond return that you get is a combination of what happens to the capital value and the coupon. If the capital value is falling and it offsets a very low coupon, not much return to be had. We've seen a series of lower highs in the price of bonds. We think we're about to go for another leg lower in price, move higher in return. So you can see that when you look at a yield chart. We moved up to three and change. Since then, we've pulled back to about 2.85%. Uh, but this is going to be a very long process. It took from 1946 to 1966 for rates to go from 1.6% to 5.5%. So this is going to be a long, drawn-out process, but very clearly fixed income looks broken. Here's why this is relevant. 
we are seeing wage inflation. We are seeing some CPI inflation. The last time this happened, it had a very significant impact on returns. So remember this, 1915 through 1946 and 1981 through 2016. If we take a picture of the long-term trajectory of stocks versus bonds since 1840, stocks have had about a 9% return, bonds about a 5 just about two, two for one. But there's two outlier periods from the early part of the 19th century to 1946 and from 19... Uh, late 1970s through 2016, where because of sharply falling rates, stocks and bonds had the same return because bond investors got their coupon plus capital appreciation as bond prices went up. When rates started to rise in 1947, stocks outperformed bonds five to one for the next 35 years. Now, I can't say for sure that's what's going to happen but we do believe that rates have bottomed and they're moving higher. Since 2000, stocks and bonds have had roughly the same return until January of this year, when stocks started to outperform. So to put that in context, in the early 1950s, bonds had a negative return for the whole decade. Stocks returned 19%. People bought stocks that had growing dividends because it offset rising interest rates. To put a point on it, in the bull market from 1951 through 1966, in stocks, bonds went up 1.6% a year, but inflation went up 1.6% a year. 0% return for a bond investor, stocks made 15% a year. So we believe we're still in the very early stages. We will see interruptions, just as they did in the 1950s and 60s. We think we are in the midst of this rally here in the late 1950s. Yet what have people been doing? They've been piling their money into bonds, afraid that the market bull market is over. And in fact, on the other side, pulling money out of equities. So investors have a habit of going exactly the wrong way at the wrong time. People were piling their way into stocks in 1999 and 2000 as an 18 year bull market was coming to an end. I've heard all year long why it is that people should not be in the stock market, why risks are too high, and clearly the market feels otherwise. We're breaking out to new all-time highs. So while people have been pulling money out of equities, I think equities go the other way. At Barometer, we are short fixed income in our macro strategy. In our income portfolios, we have virtually none. We have the minimum component in our balanced portfolios currently. We want to steer clear of the risk. Historically, in periods of rising interest rates, and this is since 2000, this is rates where the rates were rising for more than three months at a time. If I look at each of those periods, our income strategies had very positive returns in every rising interest rate period. That came from focusing on dividend growth securities. As we said today, that's where we're focused. We are not in the utilities REITs. Uh, the bond proxies, we think that this is the place not to be in the 1950s. Consumer staple stocks had a 0% rate of return. People moved to things that were highly predictable and high yielding to things that had a growth rate in their dividend uh, and were able to offset the impact of rising rates with a rising dividend stream. So we're in the early stages of a bull market. It may be we've got 8 to 12 months in front of us before we get the next major correction. I think it could be quite significant, more significant than people believe. We are positioned in the sectors that are participating. The sectors that are performing well are the sectors that are all tied to rising real interest rates and inflation historically. So market believes that that is the case. If I look across the portfolios, this is where we're focused. Equities by nature, U.S. in particular, sectoral weights, technology, industrials, financials, healthcare and consumer discretionary. In our macro portfolio, we're short fixed income, we're short utilities, we're short some currencies, Japanese yen and euros, uh, and we're short um, some bond proxies. In our equity portfolios, it's a long only portfolio, information technology, consumer discretionary, industrials and healthcare. If correlations stay low, if the index rallies 10 to 15, the leading sectors should rally 15 to 20. And so we think the opportunity now is to be targeted as an active manager. In our income portfolio, we are completely focused on equities and dividend growth. 
We watch every day for risks. And I think our job is to be cautious when they take place. But there are some clear structural themes that are going to go on way beyond the business cycle. It doesn't matter whether G uh, GDP growth is three, three and a half, or four. You know, digital transactions are not going to slow down. The move to cloud computing is not going to slow down. The move to artificial intelligence is not going to slow down. In the industrial space, defense has a clear tailwind. Transportation is restructuring. In healthcare, healthcare technologies, you know, are changing the way that we do things. So we're trying to invest in the good getting better companies in the sectors that have a structural tailwind. And I think that there are several right now. The last thing I want to address is the concern around rising short-term interest rates. We've lived in a world since 1981 where rates were in a long-term decline. And so every time the economy heated up and the Fed raised rates, they were raising rates against the grain of long-term decline. And when that happened, they often created a crisis. They tightened too much. I want to highlight that from 1945 to 1970, the trajectory of rates was higher. And so as they raised rates, it was just in line with what was happening with long-term interest rates. There were no big accidents. So through this period, stocks returned double-digit numbers. So don't be afraid of being in equities with rates rising. The thing you get concerned about is if they start to hike them too quickly or they aren't data dependent, which they say every day that they are. So we believe, having taken out these highs from January, we now have a very significant leg higher. We think that investors by nature are underinvested. There's a tremendous amount of skepticism. That's healthy. That's a wall of worry. We think that ultimately, uh, down the road, there is a real correction. And we'll watch very closely for it. And our history has been be cautious at the, at when, when, it, when you need to be. But just to put a point on the data, if you take all the occurrences of the market making a new 52-week high after more than 150 days of not making a new high, 125 days out on average, the market was up 7.2% in the 24 occurrences that took place since 1950, and the outcomes were positive 91% of the time. 250 days out, market was up 13% on average of the 24 occasions and positive 95.8% of the time. It's not time to be afraid of this market. We will get defensive if markets get defensive. We have a history of doing that. But we think right now the opportunity is to take advantage of this next leg of the bull market, and we are fully invested. So I want to thank everybody for taking the time today. I hope it was useful. Um, I'm going to uh, take a look at uh, the chat messages. If somebody has a question, uh, we'd certainly be happy to answer it, and we'll make the recording available after the call. If there's any questions, please uh, type something in. Okay, so at this time we have no questions. Uh, certainly we're happy to answer any of your calls. If you want to uh, want to call us, happy to talk. Um, and uh, look forward to talking uh, in the future. Thank you.